Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Patriots History of the United States. I'm Larry Swikart, co-author of Patriots History, along with Michael Allen and your host for this show. Um, if you haven't been with us for a while, I'm using the 15th anniversary edition of Patriots History to read from. Uh, the book is now in its 40th printing. I'm going to have to check. It may have gone into 41 by now. And I'm still working on an updated 2018 to 2023 20th anniversary edition that I will make available right here on the wildworldofhistory.com free later this year. But in the meantime, we're reading from uh, this, this version. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, when we last left off, we were dealing with Thomas Jefferson and his ideas for land in the new nation. And Jefferson believed that individuals, not the government, should have control of the land, should uh, own the land. And of course, today, the federal government owns something like a third of all the land in the country. Ridiculous. Um, Jefferson would have said, sell it all, sell it all. Um, there's no reason for government to own that land. Individuals do a much better job of keeping the land safe, environmentally sound, everything you can imagine. So um, we're looking at Jefferson. His influence on these things was really fundamental. Even though he didn't write some of these laws, they're all Jefferson's ideas. So I'm starting on page 112, the first full paragraph. Jefferson also applied the scientific method to a land policy component of the Ordinance of 1784. He called for the use of a grid system in the survey of public lands. Moreover, Jefferson aimed to use the national domain to immediately place free or at least cheap land in the hands of actual settlers, not the national government. His and David Howell's land policy proposal reflected their agrarianism and their acknowledgement of the widespread de facto preemption or squatter's rights on the American frontier that was later codified into law. As economist Hernando de Soto said and has argued in his book, The Mystery of Capital, so I'm going to do something I don't usually do here. <laughs> I'm going to share a screen with you. And of course, you're all familiar, before I get into DeSoto, you're all familiar with Mel Gibson's movie, Braveheart, and how they are constantly talking about titles and deeds and deeds and titles and titles and lands and deeds and titles and titles and lands. It goes on and on, I mean, throughout the whole movie. And many of you probably thought that those titles they were referring to were that of Prince, or Duke, or Count, or Earl, or if you go way back to my rock and roll days, Duke of Earl, Duke, 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 Duke of Earl, Earl, anyway. Only in part, only in part did these really refer to the actual name, the title. Really, they were referring to the title deeds to the lands. And this was key when we looked at the four pillars of American exceptionalism, because this is pillar number three, right? private property with written titles and deeds. And the reason the written titles and deeds were so important is because they do not depend on force. Oral titles and deeds, it's my cow. No, it's not, it's my cow. That all depends on force. Sooner or later, just whoever has the most force. But at least with written titles and deeds, assuming the courts are even re remotely objective and unbiased and fair, you have an appeal to the law. You can say, I have a title deed to this. So to go to Hernando de Soto here for a moment, Hernando de Soto argued in his book, The Mystery of Capital, the American preemption process gave common people a means to get legal title to land, which was an early basis for capital formation. This kind of liberal and legal land policy is not present in 90% of the world, even to this day. Now, a little background on DeSoto's book. DeSoto said, kind of right off the bat, in the fight between capitalism and socialism, capitalism has won. And I know this comes as a surprise to half the members of Congress and the entire faculty at Harvard, 
but capitalism has won. But De Soto goes further and he says, okay, capitalism is clearly better than socialism or communism. It should deliver the goods. Why are there so many poor people still around if capitalism has won? That's a good question. So De Soto then asks another question. Do the poor people, are they really poor? Do they not have goods? Do they not have homes? Do they not have cars? Do they not have stuff? A great comedian, George Carlin, once did a, a long comedy routine on stuff, how you have all your stuff in your house. Maybe some of it's in a garage. Maybe some of it's in a you store it because you don't have enough room in your garage. But when you go on vacation, you pack a suitcase full of your stuff. So maybe you go to the beach. And after you unload your stuff in the hotel, you go to the beach. But you still pack more of your stuff to take down to the beach. And so your, your stuff is always traveling with you. So DeSoto asks, don't these people have stuff? And, and he travels the world. He's a Peruvian, but he goes around the world. And he concludes, yeah, they've got houses or at least homes. They've got cars. They've got property. They've got possessions. What's the problem? And the problem is they don't have legal title or deed to their stuff. And <clears throat> while in some cases this is irrelevant, if you want to build a business, you need let me put it this way. A bank will give you a loan if you don't need it. <laughs> a bank will give you a loan, but before you can get that loan, you need to show that you have something called collateral. Young people, kids, what's collateral? Stuff. It's a car. It's a house. It's possessions, an RV, a boat, stuff that has value that if you don't pay off your loan, the bank can take your car sell it and get their money back, okay? And the way you do this is you give them the title deed to your car and they have it and they don't give it back till you paid off your loan. So what's the significance of this? If you can't have title deed to stuff to get loans, you're not going to have businesses that can grow. You can never mobilize capital, bring together a lot of money to grow. And so here's a chart that DeSoto used in his book. He had several of these, but this one shows, quote, procedure to gain access to desert land for construction purposes. Um, you guys been in a desert do you know what a desert is? I live in Arizona. For the most part, it's a desert. What's in a desert? Nothing. Dirt. Desert. Nothing. So this is the procedure to gain access to dirt, to, to know nothing. Nothing developed on the land at all to build something in Egypt. And look at what happens. It took six to 14 years and over 150 separate governmental steps to get access to build land on desert in Egypt. Now, in contrast, back in 2016, I retired from the University of Dayton. My wife and I had already come out to Arizona on scouting missions. We had been looking at houses. Literally, after looking at maybe 10 houses, the very last house we looked at, we go, that's the one. The other nine are on now, but we found found our very last visit. So we secured a house in Arizona and sold our house in Dayton, Ohio, Centerville, Ohio. And essentially, it was a one-step process. That is, the realtor came over to our house with a big stack of documents, and he said, sign here, sign here, sign here, initial this. Initial that, sacrifice a chicken, make a blood, blood mark over here. And at the end of one hour, we had our Arizona house and had sold our Ohio house. Did you catch that? One hour, six to 14 years. One step, 150 steps. So 
we end up with something called the Land Ordinance of 1785. And I'm going to switch gears here and show you a different version of this. By 1785, Jefferson had left Congress and the Nationalists were looking to public land sales as a source for much needed revenue. A congressional committee chaired by Nationalist Massachusetts delegate Rufus King began to revise Jefferson's proposal, barring the basic policies of Northeastern colonial expansion Congress overlaid the New England township system on a national map. Surveyors were to plot the West into thousands of townships, each containing 36, 640 acre sections. Setting aside one section of each township for local school funding, Congress aimed to auction off the townships at a rate of $2 per acre. They're selling the land literally dirt cheap. And so, in this fashion, legislators hoped to raise quick revenue because only entrepreneurs could afford the minimum purchase, but the system broke down as squatters, speculators, and other frontiersmen avoided the provisions and snapped up lands faster than the government could survey it. Despite these new limitations in 1785, the law set the stage for American land policy charting a path toward cheap land scientifically surveyed with valid title that would culminate in the Homestead Act of 1862. To this day, an airplane journey over the neatly surveyed square corner townships of the American West proves the legacy of the Confederation Congress's land ordinance of 1785. So I'm going to share screen again with you this time. And you can see the sections. Now they start way out here in. Uh, Eastern Ohio, around the Portsmouth area, and they were to sell, uh, survey the land in these squares. And the idea was that they would not sell the land in section one, I'm sorry, not sell the land in section two until the land in section one had been sold, not sell the land in section three till one and two had been sold. And the purpose of this was not just organization, it was defense and protection against Indian attacks. But of course, we're Americans. I'm American. Nobody gonna tell me we're all gonna settle. And so immediately people went out to section 14, 22, 24, 33, and they just settled wherever they wanted, which had not been surveyed yet. So Congress had a problem. And the problem was pillar number three, private property with written titles and deeds was now clashing with pillar number two, common law, that said that the people know what they're doing. The people are the ultimate governors. So Congress sided with the people, and it said, we will create a law called preemption. We're going to let you go out there and settle. You might be, get killed by Indians, but hey, that's on you. <clears throat> but we'll let you go out and settle section 933 and wherever you want to settle. And you stay there for seven years and you build something, it has to be a house or a farm. It has to be something real. You build something, you bring a title deed to us, and we will approve it. So, what do these title deeds look like? They look like this. So Farmer Jones would go out there and say, well, my land runs from the creek down to that big hunk of trees over there, way down to that rock that looks like Jimmy Durante, all the way back to the, this other base of this mountain here and then, then back to the, the creek. And you can see over here, especially in the uh, one on the top right, how it's not exactly square. It's diamond shaped. But the one in the middle is kind of all over, literally all over the map, right? And you would take this, you would draw this up and take this in to a government office, and they would stamp it and approve it. And you had your legal title deed. Now, oops, I'm sorry. Let me go back. Don't want to talk about Napoleon right now. Now, this didn't look at all like this. 
it wasn't nice and square. And so it's very interesting when you fly across, say, Ohio or parts of Pennsylvania, New England, the land looks like jigsaw puzzles. You can see the borders, but they look like jigsaw puzzles. It's even hard to have a straight road because of the way the maps are drawn. But as soon as you start to get past the Mississippi, you notice everything's in nice squares. It's all been surveyed before it was sold off. So this was an absolutely critical moment in our nation's history. It ensured private property with written titles and deeds. It allowed people to go settle. And by the way, preemption meant that you could settle on someone else's property. And if you stay there long enough, if they don't legally kick you off in seven years, that becomes yours. Not the whole property, but where you've stayed becomes yours. This is known as squatter's rights. You know, and there's some ranches in Texas that are the size of Rhode Island, small, small nations, right? And you could conceivably go to one of these, hang out in a valley someplace, build your own little house. And if you could stay there seven years and the rancher never bothers to ride his fences and come out and see what's out there, you would have a legal claim uh, under squatter's rights. And so, folks, this is why it's so important today. We have all these issues going on in big cities where, especially in New York, uh, the liberal courts are siding with the squatters. And you can't get rid of them. Apartment owners, the people who risk their fortune to build the building to collect on rents, can't get the rents because these people are squatting there and they can't kick them out for paying renters. It's a major, major problem. Um, it, it's, it's total theft. Squatters, uh, in, in this sense, are just simply thieves. If they're settling on someone else's land, someone else's building, that's supposed to be collecting rent, they're stealing. It's nothing more than theft. Thou shalt not covet. I mean, it's, it's that simple. And, and so our laws need to be seriously reformed to allow um, uh, people who own apartments to kick people out for non-payment of rent. Now, I don't mean for any trivial, you know, they, they didn't fix a the door number came came down and they didn't fix it or some some nonsense like that. I'm not talking about that. Or you're playing your stereo at really low volumes and and the landlord says, I'm going to kick you out for that. We're not talking about that stuff. We're talking about stealing, about you coming in and living free under someone else's property that they paid for. And that kind of stuff needs to stop. Okay. Back to Patriots History, page 112. Moving to Indian policy in 1786, Congress set precedents that remain in place, the most important of which was the recognition of Indian right of soil, a right that could be removed only through military conquest or bona fide purchase. No one pretended that this policy intended that the laws would favor the Indians, and certainly Congress had no pro-Indian faction at the time. Rather, nationalist leaders wanted an orderly and, if possible, peaceful settlement of the West, which could only be accomplished if lands obtained by Indians came with unimpeachable title deeds. So let's get back to this. No knock on the Native Americans. I'm a Native American. I was born here. No knock on the Indians. But here's the truth. Many tribes, most tribes, did not have a written tradition. So again, we're back to power. It's whoever's chief at that time. Whatever land he says is theirs is what's theirs. And so if you had negotiated a treaty with an Indian chief and he died, and the next guy doesn't want to obey it, he just says, no, there was no such treaty. You say, well, we got a written document here. So, well, we don't believe in written documents. No such thing. Um, so this is a problem. Also keep in mind that often, not most of the time, but more than a few times, corrupt chiefs, they had corrupt chiefs too, just like we have corrupt politicians, would sell lands to their tribe without the knowledge or approval of the tribe. And whites come in, the tribe's going, what, what's going on? And later they said, well, the chief sold it. He's not chief anymore, too late. Whites already moved in and took the land. So it becomes a big thorny, thorny issue. Congress then appointed Indian commissioners to sign treaties with the Iroquois, Ohio Valley, Southeastern civilized tribes. 
20 sessions soon followed at Fort Stanwix, Hopewell, and other sites. Obviously, these agreements did not, quote, solve the Indian problem, nor did they produce universal peaceful relations between the races. On the other hand, the Indian Ordinance of 1786 did formalize the legal basis for land dealings between whites and Indians. Most important, established the two fundamental principles of American Indian policy, the sovereignty of the national government versus the states, who did not have authority to deal with the Indians, in orchestrating Native, Native American affairs, and the right of soil, which also necess necessitated written contractual agreements. To reiterate the points made in earlier chapters, the concept that land could be divided and privately owned was foreign to some, though not all tribes, making the latter principle extremely important, if only for claims against the government that might arise generations later. Now, I'm going to stop there, but I'm going to add one last caveat here. In this land policy, over time, only in America, get it, only in America, people could, they didn't automatically get it, but they could negotiate and get and obtain not only the rights to the land on top of the land, but the rights to everything under the land, including oil, gold, silver, turquoise, uranium, whatever it happened to be, natural gas, shale, okay? This is nowhere else in the world. No other nation allows this. All other nations, the government owns what's under your land, not you. So this is another phenomenally fundamental difference a, of American exceptionalism tied to pillar number three, private property with written titles and deeds. And we'll stop right there and pick back up here on Wednesday. Remember, I'm trying to turn Patriots history into a video series. Um, if you like the book, watch the trailer at thewildworldofhistory.com. It's the best four-minute history you will ever see, and there's only two lines of dialogue in the whole four minutes. Watch it. You'll need a hanky. It's, it's, it'll make you cry. It's so beautiful. And if you like it, buy Larry a copy. Go to the Buy Larry a Coffee button, buy me a $5 coffee. If all of you would buy me a $5 coffee, we could make this into a video series of six major hour-long videos broken down into, ready for this, four-minute sub-segments perfect for kids and their devices. Help me make the series. Buy me a coffee. And I'll see you guys back here on Wednesday. <laughs>